Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this um, National um, Monkeypox Forum. Uh, uh, thank you um, again to all the people who have shown continued interest in learning about this emerging health threat that we are navigating here in Australia. Um, before we get going, I just want to say a couple of things. Can I just say to anyone out there um, who has accessibility issues or would like live closed captions of what I or the speakers are saying, uh, you can go to the bottom right hand options under live transcript, which has the double C icon and click show subtitle. So that is... Um, uh, bottom right hand options under live transcript, uh, there's the double C icon and click show subtitles. Uh, not all of the words are correct, so it does struggle with some of the nouns, um, uh, but I should say we are going to record this and we'll, we will upload it um, on our on the AFAIA website and we'll share it through our socials uh, and you're welcome to rewatch it again where it might be easier um, to be able to um, be able to rewind things back and listen to them again. Can I also uh, acknowledge that I'm coming to you all today from Gadigal country and I just want to acknowledge um, elders past and present. Um, many of you are coming to this forum from lands across Australia uh, and can I just acknowledge elders past and present from the lands in which you're all joining us today. Um, this is a public session and as I said it will be recorded and it'll be available through our social media platforms and on our website. Um, if you would like to ask an anonymous question, you can and you can opt in to be anonymous when you ask a question, when you submit the, at the point of submitting the question. Um, uh, and none of the panellists um, or the people in the meeting uh, will know it is from you. But of course, um, you can uh, uh, ask it as yourself and, and we encourage that. Uh, my name is Heath Painter. I'm the Deputy CEO of AFAO. AFAO is the National HIV Community Controlled Peak Organisation. We're based in Sydney uh, and we have member organisations across Australia. And joining us from our New South Wales member organisation, ACON, is Matt Vaughan. And Matt will be talking to us very soon about a national health promotion program, which will continue the work that so many of us are doing to build awareness of monkeypox. And in particular, and, and, and our second speaker will touch on this uh, quite heavily, um, to build trust and confidence in the vaccine, which is our way out of this emerging health threat. Joining Matt will be Dr. Vincent Cornelis. Um, Vincent has been a regular speaker uh, on uh, monkeypox forums now uh, for uh, almost six months since we've been navigating this um, this challenging environment. And yes, we've got him back for another one. <laughs> he goes from day to day with monkeypox forums. Uh, Vincent is a doctor up here at Kirkdom Road Centre, and he's also been a doctor in Melbourne, and I think also in Queensland at one point too, Vincent. So uh, a lot of experience in sexual health right across Australia. Um, right now, Australia is up to 139 cases, so that's 139 recorded cases. Not all of those cases are active, and I think it will be fair to say at this moment um, the virus is contained in our country, and we are incredibly lucky to, other than for a small um, uh, and problematic but now controlled outbreak in Melbourne, uh, we have largely navigated this health threat very well for a whole range of reasons, but uppermost is the um, the knowledge and the vigilance of communities affected by um, monkeypox, and that is in particular gay and bisexual men. And I want to acknowledge all the community members across Australia who've really worked hard to understand this and to navigate the risk using a range of measures available, including the vaccine and also behavioural measures. And I want to acknowledge, um, like with HIV, the incredible work of communities in Australia in working to mitigate the risk and the harms of monkeypox. This forum is aimed at communities affected by monkeypox, so gay and bisexual men and people who have sex with gay and bisexual men. Um, it's not a clinical forum. I, I, we, there may be doctors here and healthcare workers here, and you're more than welcome, um, and we welcome you to this forum and welcome your questions, but we will be prioritising questions from community members. For healthcare workers out there, ASHAM is running uh, um, regular forums on monkeypox and I encourage you to access their website or to contact ASHAM about forums for 
healthcare workers on monkeypox. Um, this is not the first forum we've done for community and we'll, we'll do more um, uh, as we seek to build awareness of monkeypox and raise confidence um, and demand for vaccines as a new tranche um, starts to arrive, uh, we hope, very soon. Um, so with all that said, uh, I'm going to hand over to Matt Vaughan, our first speaker, uh, who will be speaking about, um, uh, well, demand creation and the national uh, health promotion program funded by the Commonwealth that will be launched very soon. Matt. Thanks, Heath, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Now, I'm just going to try and share my screen, and I hope that this works first time, but if anything will go wrong, it will go wrong through a demonstration. So one moment. Now, can I just check, is that working? Heath? Yep, all good, Matt. Okay, excellent. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, my name is Matthew Vaughan. I'm the Director for HIV and Sexual Health at ACON, one of AFAO's member organisations. And I work on the project, or uh, the Emanate project, uh, which has been tasked by the Australian government to run a community education campaign and vaccination awareness campaign for monkeypox. Um, for those of you that don't know uh, about Emanate, Emanate is a health and wellbeing website for gay and bisexual men. It was launched in 2017, and we've got over 500 articles on dating, relationships, both mental health and sexual health, travel, destinations. Uh, yes. So we're a partnership between Thorn Harbour Health and ACON two of Australia's leading LGBT health organisations. And as I said, uh, we've been funded by the Australian government to develop a campaign on monkeypox, but we also do a lot of education around HIV uh, and STIs. But a big thing that we understand is that gay men's lives are about much more than just HIV and STIs. And here's just some of the content that we uh, do with the community. Um, so uh, uh, as uh, the monkeypox situation started to become more and more prominent, we very quickly realised that what gay men needed most was education around some of the signs and symptoms of monkeypox and what all of that meant for them. How do they navigate sex during this time? Um, and most probably, most prominently was... Uh, how can they get vaccinated and where can they get vaccinated? I think it's safe to say, and I'm sure Vincent will agree with me, that gay and bisexual men in a large part have really good health-seeking behaviour. And I think that's a real credit to both our community and the work that's happened uh, and, you know, our relationship with PrEP and sexual health testing. And that's certainly uh, seeing great results now. Um, so we've developed a bit of a campaign uh, that will appear mostly digital. So you'll see it across all your platforms, whether you're uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Grindr, the whole lot. Um, and I'm very excited to be able to share part of it with you today. So there is about uh, seven community members that volunteered to be a part of this campaign, to be feature in this campaign. Uh, here's three of them now, and there's four more to come. That's seven, yes, I believe. Good, good maths on that, as well as a range of people that are in the background and being community extras. Um, uh, so uh, here, uh, as I said, these are the posters, uh, but we've also got a range of collateral that will go out on the different channels. But a big part of our messaging and what we try and do is make sure that it's positive and uplifting. So this campaign is called Prick, Pause, Play. Uh, the idea around prick is obviously the vaccination. The pause is about waiting the uh, two to four weeks after your vaccination for you to be optimally protected. And then the play is obviously get out there and enjoy yourself knowing that you're protected against monkeypox. Uh, here's uh, three more of the posters. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoyed or what I love is 
the community that's kind of come forward to uh, be a part of this campaign, understanding that how important it is to get messaging about monkeypox, we really want to make sure that we've got a diverse range of community members that feature in the campaign that really represent the different aspects of uh, the community that we're talking to, whether that's cisgender, gay and bisexual men, uh, trans people, uh, uh, you know, Aboriginal people of multicultural backgrounds, all of that is really important that people see and read themselves in. Uh, and you, as I said, there's two options. Uh, one is around finding your nearest vaccination location, which we're uh, hoping to support you to do, as well as find out more about monkeypox. So if you click through from one of these ads that you'll have that will appear on your phone, uh, it will either navigate you to uh, an article like this, which is what you need to know about monkeypox and what does that mean? And you can read all, all about it there and it will navigate you to uh, uh, other articles uh, that also might be a little bit more uh, specific to gay men. One of the advantages of a community organization is we can really talk about those things around sex, sexual health and pleasure uh, that you wouldn't necessarily find in a government fact sheet. In an effort to also uh, make the vaccination process easier, in our find a, loca uh, a testing location tool, we're going through and adding all the uh, vaccination locations as they start to come online. So you'll see just here where you would normally be able to sort for HIV and STI testing or rapid testing, we've added a monkeypox vaccination. And so if you enter in your, uh, uh, your location and then hit find, it will display on a map uh, where you can get vaccinated, as well as link you through to the different details that you might either need to call or a website if you need to make a booking. And I thought I, we're obviously waiting until we hear a little bit more about the supply of vaccines that's coming through to Australia, but I wanted to give you just a little teaser of some of the videos to come. Uh, and yeah, here's two of what I, uh, two of my personal favourites. There's a simpler way to protect yourself, big guy. Monkeypox is transmitting through sexual contact. But the Vax is free and available now. Prick, pause, play. Get the monkeypox shot today. Uh, so a big thank you to Trent for starring in that. Uh, I think it took him about three hours to get wrapped into that suit. Uh, and he was a real sport about it. Um, so that's one. Oh. And this is the second one, and this is Charisma. It's been a long, long winter for Charisma, and there's no way Monkeypox is going to ruin her hot girl summer. She was first in line for the shot, because, honey, it ain't pretty. Prick, pause, play. Learn more about Monkeypox today. And I really just want to say a big thank you. It's been a long... A uh, big thank you both to the Australian government for the funding of the campaign, but also to all our community members that agreed to feature in the campaign. Um, you know, it's a big thing, particularly to be, uh, uh, yeah, featured in uh, uh, messages around sex and health. Uh, but I think uh, particularly for monkeypox, we really want to make sure that we've got strong messaging out there that really speaks directly to the community. If you've got any questions, feel free to click on the emanate.com.au uh, website, or you can contact myself or Chris Williams, who's the project lead, chris at emanate.com.au. And thank you very much, Heath, back to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks for all your work on uh, over the last four, four five, six months, um, in um, particularly here in New South Wales, with all the messaging that ACON's been leading. Um, and as you said, we are very lucky that our government is engaged and interested in this issue and providing us with the resourcing to work with our community. So um, thank you to our Commonwealth Department of Health for their support. Um, before we go to um, our next speaker, Vincent, Dr. Vincent Cornelis, I just want to encourage people um, to ask any questions in the um, 
uh, in the chat box or, or in the question and answer box. Um, uh, no question is too stupid or, or wrong. Uh, this is your opportunity to ask any question that you have about monkeypox and Vincent can answer it and Matt can also assist in terms of the messaging that's been directed to community. Um, again, um, it comes back to that partnership between community and clinicians, and we are really working with the evidence to translate it in ways that's very digestible for everyone um, to be able to understand it. And um, uh, Matt and, and ACON and our members have been doing that across Australia um, and, of course, been doing it with our clinicians who are interpreting the evidence and, and applying it. So with that said, um, I'll hand over to Vincent for an update on the clinical profile of monkeypox. Thanks, Heath. I'm just going to get this sorted. Here we go. Um, apologies, I've, I've just been stuffing my face with broccoli, so if I have any green bits between my teeth, my apologies. Um, so though Heath has said this before, um, I also wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm uh, living and working, which is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And one of the joys of living in the inner west is that you may hear the occasional plane going overhead. So apologies for that. I um, also wanted to clarify that I know there has been a lot of discussion in uh, the media generally and in social media around um, monkeypox terminology. And by that, I mean, should we call this virus monkeypox? Or should we call it something else? Uh, for example, should we call it MPX or MPXV? Um, I think where we're currently at is that in community settings, we're um, still calling this virus monkeypox. So that's what I'm going with currently, um, but I recognize that that's not without problems. So just to have a look at where we're at, so I'm going to run through a couple of slides on epidemiology, as in what's happening with monkeypox spread before we move on to other relevant topics. So this is a case numbers globally um, since May. So as you can see, of course, there was no monkeypox in early May, and then we started to see a few cases and th things started to escalate quite rapidly. And at one point, sort of about here, this part of the curve, the doubling time was about 10 to 14 days, meaning that every 10 to 14 days, we doubled the number of total cases of monkeypox around the world. And it looks like it started to slow. Um, and these are the countries that have been mainly affected. So of course, initially we saw it mainly in Western Europe, particularly Germany, France, UK, and Spain, and Portugal as well. And then more recently, we saw a large increase in the US and Canada, and also subsequently spread to South America. Australia has been uh, lucky in that we haven't seen as many cases. Oh, sorry, so I should point out we currently have 71,000 cases of monkeypox around the world, and we've seen 26 deaths as a result. Uh, in Australia, um, again, monkeypox was uh, first identified in May of this year. And as of the 6th of October, which I think was Friday. Oh, sorry, I updated these slides over the weekend. Um, so as of Friday, we had 139 cases of monkeypox in Australia. Um, most of those are in Victoria, uh, 68 cases in Victoria. And most of these, so more than 40 of the cases in Victoria, uh, appear to be community transmission of monkeypox, uh, which was very concerning. But currently, fortunately, um, as of Friday, there's only one active case in Victoria. So it's now, well, it was a bit scary about a month ago, but it's now looking uh, like it's contained. In New South Wales, we've got 54 cases total. Uh, these were mostly acquired overseas. Um, as in, these were people who went overseas, got monkeypox and came back and were diagnosed uh, upon their return. Um, we had three cases that were acquired in New South Wales and two that were acquired in other mm. Australian states and then were diagnosed when they returned to New South Wales. Um, and in total, in New South Wales, five people have had to be hospitalised. I believe that two of those people were hospitalised to treat uh, secondary infections. So one of the possible complications of monkeypox infection is that you get um, bacterial infection on top of the viral infection, typically of skin lesions. Um, and typically, if you get these lesions on your genitals. Um, and the others were for um, sort of more assessment reasons. 
And then we've had sort of a small dribble of cases in the other states. So seven in Western Australia, five in Queensland, three in the ACT and two in South Australia. And I'm very happy to report that we have not seen any deaths from monkeypox in Australia. So I thought it'd be useful to quickly run through the symptoms of monkeypox. And um, some of you may already be well aware of this, but I think it's really important that people understand this, mainly so that you can recognize if you have monkeypox or, or even if you have possibly have monkeypox so that you can get appropriate um, testing and treatment. So usually monkeypox infection uh, is seen as a self-limiting infection. So it usually lasts two to four weeks and will settle down uh, without any specific treatment. Um, some people, as I alluded to, may need treatment of complications such as uh, back secondary bacterial infections, but most people, most people's monkeypox infection will uh, resolve by itself. Uh, there is classically, there's a period referred to as a prodromal period, which is kind sort of a period before the typical skin lesions appear uh, that might last one to five days. And that is characterized by swollen lymph nodes. So as in glands that are up either in your neck or in your armpits or in your groin, uh, they're usually or typically very large. So we're talking about golf ball sized lymph nodes. Um, that occurs in about 56% of people with monkeypox. During this prodromal phase, people typically have very high fever, so greater than 38 degrees. So people generally feel quite unwell. Uh, and that may be accompanied by headache, muscle pain, joint pain, or back pain. Previously, in the uh, monkeypox outbreaks that we've seen in Africa, which is where um, this has come from, previously, um, cases presented with a rash, as in a full body rash, that mainly affected the arms and the legs and the face, uh, less so the trunk. We're not really seeing that in the current monkeypox outbreak. So we're only seeing that in about 11% of cases in this outbreak. What we're seeing typically in this outbreak is these sort of discrete skin lesions. So, um, or these monkeypox lesions, rather than sort of a, what I would consider a rash sort of, by rash, I mean sort of a um, this general red sort of rash that you get um, with say um, measles or other viral infections. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing really these sort of typical skin lesions which can be like little lumps, little blisters, little pus filled blisters. They then form scabs and then eventually the scabs will fall off and they do typically leave some scarring. Um, typically uh, what you see is a loss of skin coloration. So you yeah, are left with quite pale skin uh, where the monkeypox lesions were. Um, and these lesions are infectious, so uh, and they're considered to be infectious right through to when the um, scabs have fallen off uh, and when new skin has formed underneath, so new healthy skin underneath where the scabs used to be. So right until that point, people are asked to isolate to avoid transmission to others. And what that means in terms of what isolation means, we'll talk about later, but because uh, that has changed over time as well. Um, as I said, secondary cellulitis is uh, probably the most common uh, complication and other complications are pneumonia, so lung infection, sepsis, where you sort of get this general overwhelming uh, infection syndrome requiring hospitalization, brain infection or encephalitis, which is really rare, but we've uh, had a, unfortunately a few people around the world have died as a result of that. And uh, finally, keratitis, where you get monkeypox infection in the eye. And that again, if that causes scarring, that can cause permanent visual loss or permanent uh, vision change. Um, interesting, I guess, to note is that uh, of the people who presented with monkeypox infection to various clinics, about 30% had se other sexually transmitted infections at the time of their monkeypox infection. Um, and now, sorry, not to bore everyone, but just to quickly run through atypical presentations. And these are important because these can make things really confusing. Uh, and this is what's really kind of stumped clinicians at times to, when trying to diagnose monkeypox infections because these are uh, kind of unusual presentations. So about one in five people will not develop what we, these prodromal symptoms. So not these are people who don't present with swollen lymph nodes. They don't have fevers or headaches or muscle pains uh, or joint pain. They just come in with the lesions, typically genital lesions, anal lesions, or lesions in and around the mouth. Um, the lesions themselves can look a bit unusual. So they, while I've described this sort of these lesions that are lumps and blisters and uh, pus filled blisters, um, that's not always what they look like. So uh, doctors and nurses do need to keep a, a sort of a 
an eye out for any other unusual lesions and consider that these may be monkeypox lesions. As I said, lesions uh, can often occur only in the, the anal or genital areas. And finally, um, one symptom that had been overlooked at the start of the epidemic is that some people just present with uh, butt pain, so rectal pain and bleeding um, and no other symptoms. And when they've looked into this more closely, they found that in those cases, people have had these monkeypox lesions up their butt, and that's where the bleeding has come from. Um, so if you ever you know, develop uh, pain in your bum and bleeding, uh, and you particularly currently if you've had sex overseas in recent times or had new sexual partners that may have been overseas, then um, I would encourage you to go to your local sexual health clinic and get that checked out. Um, the question always arises, uh, you know, how many of these people or how many people with monkeypox um, don't have symptoms at all? So what is the sort of rate of asymptomatic carriage, if you like? Because um, this is this is clearly often a problem with uh, sexually transmitted infections that many people don't have symptoms, which is why we encourage people to have screening for sexually transmitted infections. Fortunately, it looks like with monkeypox, this is really quite uncommon. Um, initially, it was thought that it didn't happen at all, um, and the French and Belgians have looked at this in more detail, and they found that perhaps about 6% of, um, so they did a study where they retrospectively went back, so they went back and screened all these sexual health uh, samples, so all these people had come to a sexual health clinic, not with concern about monkeypox, but they just come in because they had a sexually transmitted infection, or because they wanted to get screened for sexually transmitted infections, and they went back and they pulled all their swabs out of the lab and tested all of those swabs for monkeypox and they found that in Belgium and France about six percent of those asymptomatic gay and bisexual men had monkeypox. Now of course that is that's in Belgium and France where they have a lot more monkeypox than we have um, so the situation is entirely different um, but it does highlight that perhaps um, people can have monkeypox infection without having symptoms but it's still much less common than we see with any other sexually transmitted infection. So Matt already touched on this around transmission, so I'm going to skip over most of this. Um, but as he highlighted, transmission is by direct skin to skin contact, uh, for example, during sex. And we really are talking about close skin to skin contact. We haven't sort of seen uh, transmission at dance parties or any sort of other scenarios where there might be some sort of fleeting skin contact. We're really talking about, I think it's fair to say, we're talking about genital to genital or genital to mouth or mouse to anus um, transmission. Um, lesions, so monkeypox lesions may occur at the point of contact, as I said, commonly the genitals, anus and mouse. Um, and then there's all these theories about, you know, maybe it could have spread through other ways, maybe it could have spread through droplets, maybe it could have spread through uh, contaminated surfaces, uh, but we ha really haven't seen that happen in the current outbreak. I think we can be really confident about that now. Um, there have been a couple of cases where people have uh, unfortunately transmitted monkeypox to their pets um, through close contact. I'm not suggesting that was sexual contact, but just uh, through close contact. Um, so it, that is a consideration when someone is diagnosed with monkeypox to make sure that their pets um, are um, not exposed to monkeypox at that time. Um, and as I said, people with monkeypox are considered infectious from the time they first get symptoms right through to their skin lesions have fallen off and healed properly. Uh, importantly, uh, some data out of um, Italy and the UK has suggested that the monkeypox virus can persist in semen, so in sperm, for a further eight to 12 weeks after someone has recovered from monkeypox. So this is after someone has uh, their skin lesions have completely healed for another eight to 12 weeks there might be monkeypox in their sperm so it's recommended that people continue to use condoms for any sexual activity that might expose other people to their semen for that uh, time period so for the eight to 12 weeks um, in terms of isolation advice and there is this is a, a sort of a, a moving uh, field um, and there is variation from state to state as to what people are asked to do in terms of isolating. Um, if you're a close contact, so if someone tells you that, uh, someone who you've had sex with tells you that they have monkeypox, then it's advised to abstain for, from sex for 21 days and monitor for symptoms. And of course, if you develop symptoms during that time to seek medical care. Um, if you have been diagnosed with monkeypox, then it's advised to not have any sex at all. And that includes kissing and sort of uh, close touching. Uh, 
you know, touching genitals um, until all lesions have healed completely. Now, for most people, that will be, say, three weeks, um, but it can be longer. We've had some people um, who have experienced monkeypox infection that's lasted four weeks and sometimes even five weeks, but that's been unusual, I think. Um, and then, as I said, after you've recovered from monkeypox, it's important to continue using condoms for a further eight weeks, at least, for all activity that involves exposing someone else to your semen. Um, some jurisdictions are stricter on this. So if you, like, fortunately, currently, people aren't really getting diagnosed with monkeypox in Australia, uh, and fingers crossed it stays that way. Um, but if we do st start to see another outbreak, um, then you may get different advice depending on which um, state you live in. So in terms of uh, monkeypox prevention, um, it's important, as I said, to be aware of what symptoms to look out for, uh, particularly after you've returned from overseas. Um, of course, particularly if you uh, had sex overseas in any of those countries where monkeypox is a bigger problem. Um, and if that's the case, then consider taking a break from sex for 21 days just to avoid the risk of exposing other people to potential monkeypox infection. Um, these things have all been discussed at community level, and I'm not saying that any of this is the right answer, but I think it's all worth considering, uh, perhaps limiting the number of sexual uh, partner numbers um, if there is local transmission, which, as I said, is currently not occurring in Australia. Um, but if that were to change, then people may wish to reduce their number of sexual partners. Um, I think in those scenarios, it's also important to exchange contact information with sexual partners so that if you're subsequently diagnosed with monkeypox, then you can tell your sexual partners that they've been in uh, contact with monkeypox. Um, of course, uh, it would be good to avoid skin-to-skin -skin contact with people with possible signs or symptoms of monkeypox. Um, people could consider other types of sex that reduce um, skin contact and reduce saliva use. So perhaps, you know, not using saliva as a lubricant for anal sex might be a good idea during a monkeypox outbreak. Uh, and similarly, uh, using condoms for anal sex might be helpful. Condoms won't 100% protect uh, against transmission of monkeypox, but if, uh, if you'd like to bottom um, with uh, casual sexual partners, then, you know, it, if there is, again, a monkeypox outbreak, then it, you might be... Um, it might be a good idea to use condoms or get your sexual partners to use condoms to reduce your risk of getting monkeypox up your butt because that is really uncomfortable. If someone has monkeypox in their anal canal, um, like I said, it's painful, it, um, it bleeds, and it makes going to the toilet quite difficult. So using condoms might, might may not reduce your risk of getting monkeypox overall, might, but it might reduce your risk of getting it in a particularly uncomfortable place. People, again, have suggested sex bubbles like they did during COVID. Um, and of course, most importantly, uh, the best way you can protect yourself is by getting vaccinated if that vaccine is available to you, um, and especially if you're planning to have sex overseas. There, one question that I think is really important is, uh, what does this mean for people living with HIV? Um, again, there's currently not a lot like a large amount of data out there there was a case series from nigeria where of course there is uh generally a lot more hiv than in australia um, and they found that people with hiv experienced more prolonged monkeypox illness so the monkeypox illness uh, lasted longer they had bigger monkeypox lesions and they had high, higher rates of secondary bacterial infections um, so they more often needed antibiotics to help with those bacterial infections. Um, the UK has suggested that uh, the following sort of groups of people might be at risk of more severe monkeypox infection, and that's people with HIV who have a CD4 count of less than 200, um, people with HIV who've had recent HIV-related illnesses, such as an AIDS diagnosis in the previous six months, and people who are living with HIV who do not have an undetectable viral load. So these people might be at higher risk of uh, complications. Now, this is a very busy slide, which I'm not going to run through in detail, but basically to say that there are currently vaccine eligibility criteria, uh, and this uh, was in, uh, put in place because there is a uh, globally limited supply of vaccine, uh, including in Australia. So really, the governments and public health units tried really hard to work out how to get this vaccine to people who uh, were at highest risk of monkeypox infection. Um, and again, that was decided on a state-by-state -state basis by the local health authorities. Um, if 
I'm sure uh, we'll talk about the eligibility criteria in uh, later on, but basically if you meet one of these eligibility criteria, then it would be a really good idea if you haven't already um, acquired a monkeypox in uh, immunization or vaccination to register your interest. Um, and I'm sure Heath and Matt will share details on how to do that. Um, I just wanted to quickly move on, unless there's any, I'll keep an eye out for questions, sorry. Is monkeypox, and there is a question in the question box, is monkeypox transmitted in saliva? Um, the short answer is yes, it probably is. Um, and that's one of the things they're currently looking at is um, looking at uh, mouth, swab, mouth swab tests or screening for monkeypox infection. Um, so the effectiveness of the monkeypox vaccine. So most of the data on effectiveness of the vaccine is based on antibody studies. So this is laboratory studies where they've given the vaccine to someone and they've uh, tested their blood and they've looked for monkeypox antibodies in their blood to see whether the vaccine had an effect. Um, and that's what all the sort of published effectiveness data is based on. Uh, and that's because we haven't, we hadn't, I should say, hadn't yet been able to work out the clinical effectiveness of the monkeypox vaccine because there was no monkeypox outbreak in which to test it, but that's currently being investigated. Uh, there we go. Um, so based on antibody levels, these are the published uh, effectiveness rates of the vaccine. And these are uh, from the MVA 011 study, which is the study that the manufacturer uh, ran in order to get the um, vaccine licensed. So as you can see, if you're uh, living with HIV, um, one to two weeks after your first immunization, uh, about 29% of people will be protected. 28 days or a month after your first vaccination, 67% of people living with HIV will be protected. And um, then at 28 days, people have their second immunization. And then at 42 days, so that's 14 days after the second immunization, 96% of people living with HIV would be protected. If you're not living with HIV, then at one to two weeks after your first shot, you have a similar 29% uh, chance of being protected. At 28 days after your first shot, you'll have an 83% chance of being protected. And then at 42 days, sorry, or two weeks after your second shot, you'll have a 98% chance of being protected. So uh, I think ultimately what we can see is that um, people with HIV and people without HIV will achieve a similar level of protection against monkeypox from a two-dose schedule of monkeypox vaccine. But importantly, it takes a bit longer, oops, it takes a bit longer for people with HIV, that was my fault, um, it takes a bit longer for people with HIV to achieve that protection which I think is important. So this is just based on antibody levels. And then um, there's currently a study that's not yet been published, um, but it, it, they finished their analysis. Um, this was conducted in Israel, uh, nearly 2000 gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in Israel who attended um, a sexual health service, the Clalit Health Service. Um, and they worked at, and all these men were eligible for the uh, monkeypox vaccine based on the local Israeli eligibility criteria. And so this is important because this is looking at clinical effectiveness. Like it's, it's all good and well to know what antibodies are doing, but we want to actually know, you know, how well does it actually protect against infection? Um, so of these nearly 2000 men, uh, almost 900 of them or 44% were vaccinated and completed at least 25 days of follow-up after a single dose of vaccine. So this is important. This is only one dose of vaccine. As I said, normally what we do is we give two doses of vaccine 28 days apart. But in this study, they looked at what happened after a single dose of vaccine. Of all the uh, men who were in this study, 32% were living with HIV. They were not equally distributed between those who were vaccinated and those who were unvaccinated. Um, sorry, just to clarify, this is a cohort study. So they weren't, there wasn't an intervention of vaccinating people. This is just a cohort of people who are attending this clinic who are free to decide whether or not they get the monkeypox vaccine and they followed up over time to see what their chances of or what their risk is of actually developing monkeypox infection. Um, so overall, they found uh, 18 uh, monkeypox infections in this cohort. So 18 infections amongst 2,000 gay, and bis gay bisexual and other men who have sex with men. Um, three of these infections occurred in people who had received a single dose of vaccine. 
and 15 infections occurred in those who had not received any vaccine. So that means that if you in, if you're in this cohort and you were um, vaccinated, then you had a an incidence of uh, monkeypox of 40 per 40 cases or 40 infections per 100 person years of follow up. Whereas if you were vaccinated with a single dose, that was six infections per 100 case person years of follow up. Which means, to put it in a nutshell, that the effectiveness of a single dose of vaccine appears to be 79 percent single dose. Um, quite a wide confidence interval for those of you who like statistics, um, so it makes it a little bit difficult to generalize, uh, but it is encouraging that even a single dose of vaccine appears to provide reasonable level of protection. Um, now, I just wanted to um, talk about subcutaneous and intradermal vaccines. Sorry, there is a question here. Um, Anonymous has asked, I'm a straight woman who has a bisexual male partner who is active in the gay community. And my understanding is that I can't get the vaccine at the moment. Um, so it's a really good question. Uh, I think um, in principle, what I would like to see is that anyone who has sex with uh, gay, bisexual or other men who have sex with men should be able to get a vaccine. Um, and I know that Currently, that's probably not happening in most jurisdictions because of the limited supply of vaccine. So currently, the vaccine is really targeted at gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men who are traveling overseas or who have multiple sexual partners or who are engaged in sex work. Uh, and there's some other categories. Um, but as and we'll talk about the further rollout in a few slides um, as more vaccine comes online, um, that will get broadened to allow more people to get the vaccine. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, you may currently not be able to get the vaccine, but you should be able to get it soon. Um, I just wanted to quickly talk about uh, subcutaneous and intradermal vaccination, because of course, this is a hot topic. So uh, background. Um, so the vaccine was originally designed to be given as a subcutaneous uh, injection, which is how you do this. So that means you get half a mil of the vaccine and you get your needle and you stick it through the skin and into the subcutaneous tissue. So this is the sort of fatty layer that's between the skin and the muscle. And you deposit the whole half a mil there. Um, they've done studies, and I'll show you the data in a second, um, but they've looked at the effectiveness of giving this intradermally. So you, when you do an intradermal vaccine, you get a much smaller needle. And rather than go through down to here, you just go through the top layer of the skin. So you go through the epidermis and then bleb up a little bit of uh, the vaccine right under the skin. And the benefit of doing that is you only need 0.1 of a mil rather than 0.5 of a mil. And of course, that means that if you've got a vial that's 0.5 mil and the monkeypox vaccine comes in a 0.5 mil vial, if you're giving it intradermally, you can use one vial for five people. Uh, so in the scenario that we're currently in, where we have very much globally limited supply of vaccine, um, most uh, jurisdictions, most governments have now moved to recommending intradermal dosing in order to be able to vaccinate five times as many people with the same uh, amount of supply. Now, so, and this is what it'll look like. So if someone sticks a needle in your arm uh, for an intradermal vaccine, you get this sort of bleb just underneath the skin. It's basically a little blister that's formed um, from injecting the vaccination material. Um, now, as you can see on this picture, this is commonly done on the forearm. And that's uh, the only reason for that. Well, there's a couple of reasons. The main reasons is that it's easy to get through. So if you're running a busy vaccine clinic, it's really easy to get people to show you their forearm and just pop it in their forearm and off they go. Um, the other reason is mainly historical in that um, these injection techniques were mainly used for something called MAN2 testing, which is an old uh, testing, uh, old test for tuberculosis or TB. Um, and that uh, testing site needed to be monitored for about a week after the vaccine was administered or the injection was administered. So it needed to be in a place that was easily visible. That's not the case for monkeypox vaccine. And the reason I'm pointing this out, slightly controversially perhaps, is that this injection does leave quite an obvious red mark for several weeks, if not a couple of months. Uh, it's not a permanent scar, or at least I don't think it's a permanent scar in most people. Um, but my only concern is that because it's in such an obvious place, um, it kind of marks people as being someone who needs a monkeypox vaccine, which um, as you can imagine, has implications around stigma. Um, so 
if you are getting a vaccine, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but if you're getting a vaccine uh, and you don't want this on your forearm, you're well within your right to ask to have it in a different location because ultimately skin is skin is skin. And as long as it goes into your skin, you'll be protected. Um, so as I said, generally intradermal vaccine is currently preferred, uh, mainly because of the supply issue. Um, and uh, vaccination with uh, 0.1 of a mil of intradermal vaccine appears to be just as effective as uh, vaccination subcutaneously with 0.5 of a mil. So just because it's a smaller volume doesn't mean it's less effective. Uh, intradermal vaccination is a really effective method of giving vaccines. Um, the only caveats are that the intradermal route is not recommended for people who are severely immunocompromised. So by that we mean, for example, people with, living with HIV who have a CD4 count of less than 250, um, but otherwise should be just as effective. Um, and the intradermal route is not recommended, oh sorry, but otherwise similarly for uh, if you're living with HIV and your CD4 count is above 250, so if you have a CD4 count of say 500 or 800, um, then intradermal dosing um, should be just as effective as subcutaneous dosing. So that shouldn't be an issue. Intradermal route is also not recommended for uh, the first dose of post-exposure prophylaxis. So for example, if uh, someone tells you that someone that you had sex with a couple of days ago tells you that they've got monkeypox and you go for a post-exposure dose of vaccine because you haven't been vaccinated yet, then it's not recommended that you have the intradermal one. Uh, in that case, it's recommended that you have the subcutaneous one just because it hasn't been tested in that scenario. Um, I've talked about the mark and I've talked about the forearm. So what is the current monkeypox vaccine situation? Uh, as I've said repeatedly, there's a global shortage of vaccine. Um, I do have to say that Australian Commonwealth and state governments were really some of the earliest governments in the world to, su to secure supply. Um, it was really impressive, and but unfortunately, there's still limited supply, and so the, the because of that limit, the first supply of vaccine had quite strict eligibility criteria, and and is now starting to run out. Um, the the next supply, which is a much larger supply, is expected to arrive this month, probably towards the end of the month, and as a result, um, we should have much uh, laxer or broader eligibility criteria when that uh, supply arrives. And then the final delivery of a much larger and even larger supply, I've been talking, you know, well, more than 100,000 doses or more than 100,000 vials, which of course translates to 500,000 doses if we're giving it intradermally. Um, that supply is expected to arrive in February next year, just in time for World Pride. Um, as I said, uh, vaccine delivery strategies are different in different states, um, and there's also a difference in whether people will be offered a second dose at this point. As I've mentioned, it's a two-dose course, so one dose uh, to start with, and then a second dose at least 28 days later. It can be given later than 28 days. If it's given at two months, that's fine as well, or three months even. Um, in some states, I believe Victoria currently is only offering a single dose. Um, New South Wales was also offering a single dose, but is starting to move towards giving people second doses. Um, but basically, the, the message to take home, the take home message even, is if you are currently eligible, then I would encourage you to consider registering your interest and um, get access to the vaccine. I know it's like currently there's no community transmission in Australia, but Again, you know, World Pride is coming next year, and I think we need to be uh, sure that we're ready. I always talk about stigma uh, when talking about monkeypox. Um, I think, um, first of all, I think the governments and the community orgs have done a brilliant job in their efforts to prevent stigma of monkeypox. Um, Clearly, monkeypox has a high potential to become stigmatized, as has happened for other STIs and as happened for HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and stigma is a big problem that we all need to um, be aware of and we all need to try to combat uh, even within the community itself. And the reason for me, I think stigma, I mean, stigma is, of course, important for lots of reasons. It's just um, terrible if someone has monkeypox and they also feel stigmatized as a result of having monkeypox. It's bad enough having the monkeypox itself. But the other problem is that stigma creates a fear of disclosure, um, as in people don't want to tell other people they have 
an infection that is stigmatized and that then forms a barrier to seeking care, it forms a barrier to testing and a barrier to contact tracing. So it is really important that we keep up our efforts to make sure that no one feels stigmatized about having monkeypox or being exposed to monkeypox or stigmatized for having the monkeypox vaccine because it's clearly not what we want. Now, I wanted to finish on a little bit of good news. Um, and that is that the case numbers globally, the daily case numbers are dropping. So the graph I showed, showed you at the start was the cumulative case numbers. Um, so, you know, each day stacked upon the, the last, um, but these are just the daily case numbers. This is a seven day rolling average to try and even out the spikes. Uh, again, for those of you who like statistics, um, but so we at uh, sort of early August, we hit a peak of daily case numbers over a thousand cases a day worldwide. Um, and now since then we've dropped and we're now sitting sort of around 400 cases a day worldwide. So that's really impressive. And as Heath mentioned at the start, I think that's, um, I mean, it's due to a, a range of factors, but I think um, the amount of mobilization that we've seen in the gay community has been uh, incredible and the community has responded really actively to this infection this infection and of course um, even though supply of vaccines has been limited I think it's been used really well um, to protect people who are at highest risk of monkeypox infection so the take-home messages are, I'm sorry if I've gone over time by the way um, the take-home messages are be alert but not alarmed um, particularly at the moment Things are under control and we hope we'll keep it that way uh, and certainly Australia is well positioned to avoid a large monkeypox outbreak. Currently the main risk for getting monkeypox is male to male sex overseas because we're currently not seeing much local transmission. Regardless I would say that if you develop a new genital lesion or an anal lesion or a mouse lesion or if you develop anal pain or anal bleeding please make sure you seek medical advice and avoid sexual contact until you've been assessed for monkeypox and for other sexually transmitted infections. Um, if you're going overseas, uh, please be extra vigilant uh, for three weeks after returning over from overseas. Um, and of course, if you are going overseas, please um, try to get a vaccine before you go. Try and get at least one dose. Ideally, you know, you would get two doses before you go, but that may not be possible, particularly if your time to before your trip is limited. Um, if you're eligible for a vaccine, please consider getting vaccinated. Um, and as I said, full protection does require two doses, at least 28 days apart, and then uh, a further two weeks after your last dose to really um, achieve full protection. And finally, if you're a close contact and you've not been vaccinated, please consider getting a, a post-exposure uh, vaccination, and you should be able to get that from your local sexual health clinic. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, always uh, comprehensive. I know you've done so many of these, so um, um, thanks for that update. Um, I, I want to ask Matt some questions, but I just want to ask you a couple of questions of, of uh, just to clarify some, some things. With the saliva question, um, uh, 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 just to be really clear on that with the audience, um, you know, people who um, uh, hug a friend um, uh, or or, or come into contact in a way that is affectionate with another person, the likelihood of transmission in that scenario, um, of course, if, if there's an, an open sore or 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 or, or, um, or lesion, that there's high risk. But uh, but uh, but with the assumption that that any sore is covered, what's the risk of transmission from from that kind of level of contact? Are you asking me or Matt? Yeah, yeah, just because I just want to clarify this just because I think there just needs to be some understanding of, yeah, yeah. The, of, of the very little risk. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I think it's, uh, again, it goes back to the fact that it's really unlikely that people have uh, monkeypox without any symptoms. Um, and the main risk from saliva will be if someone has monkeypox lesions in their mouth. Yeah. Um, and again, um, it's unlikely for someone to have monkeypox lesions in their mouth and not be aware of it because um, they're quite painful lesions. Um, and well, when I say quite painful, they're actually extremely painful lesions. Um, 
there have been a few case reports now where people have described the, and I'm sure this has been on, people have seen, may have seen this on social media as well, where people have described their experience of having monkeypox. And sort of the, one of the predominant features is the amount of pain that they experience from the lesions themselves. So the reason I'm saying that is that, um, as I, uh, yes, as you correctly point out, the, the risk from just plain old saliva exposure is um, minimal, except if someone has monkeypox infection and has lesions in their mouth but then you would expect that they were aware that they had lesions in their mouth. Yeah. So really in Australia, um, we, with our literate and vigilant population, the, the risk of transmission through saliva is just, you know, in, uh, astonishingly low. Yeah. And again, I think in Australia, in a way, we're lucky in that, as you said, we have a very health literate community um, and we also have uh, universal healthcare. So people can yes. uh, get healthcare when they, notice that something is wrong whereas in some countries like parts of the US for example even if you think you might have monkeypox it might still be really hard to get anyone to look at you yeah yeah so so really what the, the messaging out of this is that really the, the 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 mode or the route of transmission is largely through sexual contact um, um in a setting like Australia yeah sorry I had my microphone off but yes and 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 Vincent, just one other question, just with the intradermal um, infections, I just want to just just clarify this for people because I know a lot of people have had these. There is very little risk of um of of a long term scar from that, isn't there? I mean, I, I've got a number of friends who've had them, and yes, they had a scar, you know, for a week or so, but it's completely disappeared in all of them. They're, they're, yeah, it's something I don't that think appears in the main, doesn't it? No, it, it doesn't. Uh, I don't think it does uh, produce permanent scars. Um, it's very different. So um, the the old smallpox immunization, the ACAM two thousand, certainly did produce a gnarly scar, um, and that was all that because that but that was a very different vaccine. That was a live virus vaccine. Um, I I don't think there's a risk of people getting permanent scars from intradermal administration of the MVA. BN vaccine, so the third generation um, smallpox vaccine that we're using. Um, but, and I say but, <laughs> I don't like using the word but, but um, but the, the little lump or the little mark, that uh, the little red mark that you get from the intradermal vaccine can persist for quite a few weeks. I think mine is still there um, yeah. six weeks after getting the vaccine. So, um, which is not a problem. It will go away. But the only reason I bring it up is that if you aren't out uh, about having sex with men um, and maybe you're in a, an occupation where you wear short sleeves at work, um, then you may wish to get the vaccine in a different location other than your forearm. And as I said, you, you can ask the vaccine clinic to put it somewhere else. And certainly ASHIM, uh, so the Australasian Society for HIV Medicine, which has developed training resources for healthcare professionals has highlighted that in the training resources. So the nurses and doctors you are seeing in the vaccine clinic should know that they can give it in a different location. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's important for people to know that by having an intradermal infection you, uh, injection, you are making the, 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 the number of um, uh, doses go a lot further than if we would were, were administering it in um, a subcutaneously. And there's a real yeah, exactly. strategy for this. It's very important. to. I understand. think it's really important. Um, and there's no, other than the mark on your arm, there really is no downside to having it intradermally. It, it's not like a second grade or a second class vaccine. Yeah. It works really well. Um, it just maybe... If, if you're worried about the mic, get it somewhere else. I suggest the inside of your upper arm is a uh, discreet location to have it. Thank you. There you go. You can ask your nurse for for to have the uh, the injection there, Matt. Just to just to bring you in, and Vincent, thanks again, um, Matt. You you do a lot of the work in communications around well around HIV and now monkeypox. Um, mm. Vincent showed a very busy slide that had the criteria for getting a monkeypox in, injection of course that criteria is evidence based and it's necessary but that 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 that's very scientific and it's it, it's all around clinical governance but but how do you and it goes back to the question that the anonymous asker asked around um being a woman that has sex with bisexual men how, how do you communicate something like that that's very complex to the community in a way that ensures that everyone who should be able and who needs a, a vaccination can actually get one. 
Yeah, it's a good question, Heath. And I think uh, Vincent gave a, a quite a good answer to begin with. And in terms of like that was absolutely necessary to make sure that we got the best protection out of the small amount of doses that we had. I think as we start to see more vaccine coming through uh, into Australia with, you know, hopefully more doses coming uh, by later this month, uh, that eligibility criteria will start to open up a little bit more. And certainly what we're start or what we will start to say in New South Wales around that is, you know, the vaccine is for sexually active gay and bisexual men who are having casual sex or multiple partners. That's you know, uh, quite clear. And then anybody that may be having sex with these groups. So that opens it up for, um, you know, people uh, like the question. Uh, so someone who's straight that's having sex with a gay or bisexual man, then they should absolutely consider getting vaccinated as well. I should say, though, at the moment, particularly where we are in Australia, where uh, even though while we're waiting for that vaccine rollout, you're not necessarily at any high risk at this point um, because we've got such low numbers in Australia. It's not to say, oh, I need to be very careful about having sex with gay and bisexual men at the moment. We're not there. Um, but it is something that to ensure that we maintain protection, as soon as you're able to get the vaccine, you do, uh, it's strongly recommended that you consider it. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a, a message to go and see your, your local sexual health physician or public sexual health clinic if, if you Absolutely. want more information on this. Um, and Matt, the, the the main messaging that we're communicating to to community at the moment, and, and and this hasn't really changed a lot, as I understand it, really across the last five and six months since we've had this. But can you just 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 tell us what the main messaging is that we're giving to people? both those who are vaccinated, whether it's with one dose or two, and those who are unvaccinated, and perhaps also the, the, the question around travelling to settings where there's community transmission. Yeah, definitely. So uh, if you're unvaccinated, the overarching message, get vaccinated as soon as you're able, uh, particularly if you are travelling to uh, a setting that may be experiencing an outbreak, and that to allow enough time uh, to get ideally uh, two doses in before you travel. Um, that's probably the key message, um, as well as staying uh, up to date with public health messaging that might be in, in uh, the country that you're traveling to. Here in Australia, uh, you know, if you're not traveling, the kind of messages that we're putting out into community is exactly, uh, you know, where in terms of making sure you're exchanging contact information with your hookups. Um, and because that will really assist with contact tracing efforts if we're able to, whether it's go, uh, go through grinder messages or uh, you know WhatsApp details, numbers, or an email, uh, that makes that job really easy. We are talking to people about you know, potentially limiting sexual partners uh, the, if you're not vaccinated, uh, you might want to create a bubble or create a network of people that you know that you've got regular communication with and that you can talk to regularly. Uh, and that might be uh, who you have sex with for this period of time until you're able to receive your full vaccination. The, uh, I think, like I said before, though, um, in terms of some of the other strategies that might that you might want to consider and certainly that Vincent talked about in the slide and I'm just having trouble to recalling that it was uh, the bubble reducing your sexual networks exchanging contact information Vincent what there's one more uh, I think I mentioned sort of vaguely the idea of having sex in a way that doesn't uh, necessarily expose you to um, bodily fluids or saliva or skin yes. which I guess speaks to that <laughs> wonderful ad that you guys made where you can wrap wrap yourself up in a rubber suit um but and, but you and know, people can be creative in how they do that like i think i, I say it, it's, it's sort of a, a in a joking tone but i think it, it, there is there are ways of doing this um should community transmission become a big issue and should people not have access to vaccines 
And I think that's the the kind of key point is if we were being very careful with our messaging at the beginning. So suggesting sex where you don't have contact with one another. So it might be virtual sex or masturbation from a distance. But I really want to urge that I don't think we're necessarily there yet, that um, making sure that you've got contact information or, you know, reducing sexual partners or decreasing the amount is really kind of those key steps. Um, and then for vaccinated people, you know, I think making sure that you're fully vaccinated with your second dose um, and that you've waited that amount of period to ensure optimum protection. Um, and then what you can do is certainly talk to your friends and your sexual networks about also getting vaccinated as well. I don't think it's the case of, you know, having to uh, segregate your sexual partners only with other vaccinated people because, you, as you can saw from the Vincent's numbers, uh, the, the protection is incredibly high. Uh, but certainly we want to be encouraging uh, as many people as possible to get their vaccination. And we know that peers and messages from your friends are the most effective form of advertising. Yeah, Matt, and I think that's a really important point. I think, um, I think as I said, I, I celebrate that we um, seem to have uh, come through this wave of monkeypox and it's, it seems all under control now. But I, I think that um, it's important that we keep talking about it and make sure that people are aware that there is a vaccine and to encourage people to get the vaccine, given that it's likely that we'll see much more monkeypox in the new year. Definitely. I think particularly as we know, we've got uh, a, a big amount or a large amount of international travellers that will be coming uh, for the festival season, both in Sydney and Melbourne. And what we want to make sure is that as many people across, uh, you know, in those jurisdictions or across Australia are fully protected against monkeypox. Um, thank you. Thanks, Matt and Vincent. V Vincent, a question here, um, uh, w w which is g goes to the clinical aspect of it. Um, someone who had um, uh, ACAMP, uh, the, the, the old second generation uh, vaccine as a child, so I think that was stopped in the early 70s, I think, in Australia. Yeah, 1980. 1980. Um, yeah. Does that provide adequate protection against monkeypox? Uh, firstly, and then um, what impact does this have on eligibility for yeah. uh, a Janaeus vaccine? Look, great question. Uh, the old vaccine was, and I want to say this because I love it, the old vaccine was called the ACAM 2000, which makes it sound very futuristic. <laughs> um, and, and as you said, that was stopped in the, in 1980. Um, but so to answer the question, uh, yes. So it is thought that having had a childhood ACAM 2000 provides some level of protection against getting uh, monkeypox, but not sufficiently. So um, when people have had a childhood um, ACAM 2000, it's recommended that they still go ahead and book in for an a uh, MVA ABN, so a third generation uh, monkeypox or smallpox vaccine. Um, but they will likely only need one dose of vaccine rather than two, because basically we're just boosting up the immunity that they uh, were provided from the or original ACAM 2000. And so they will, with with the second round of vaccines, they'll have uh, the people in that situation will be uh, eligible for one vaccine. People are already eligible. So um, in the first tranche, uh, if people were traveling overseas and they'd only had the ACAM 2000 in childhood, they uh, were already eligible to come in and get a get a second or get te or just technically, I guess, for them a second dose, but the first dose of the new vaccine. Great, thank you. Um, and Vincent, I, I, we've got some time left. I just want to quickly touch on the scenario where we do have more cases of community transmission or indeed cases of people to, returning to Australia without vaccination um, with monkeypox. Can you just very quickly touch on treatment for monkeypox? Mm. And, and and also, so I know that there's a that there's an antiviral treatment that's available here in special circumstances. But can you also just quickly talk about symptomatic treatment too for people who may experience pain? Because you you mentioned in it that that people that the, that the symptoms can be very painful. Yeah, when people are in care; they're not necessarily on their own, are they? Uh, uh, no, are exactly. Serious? So what's happened? So what we saw? So we did have a bit of a monkeypox outbreak a few months ago um, that needed to be managed, um, and what tended to happen is that most of the people who got monkeypox were um, managed in home through hospital in the home arrangements. So where they would be phoned by uh, the public health unit, uh, by the medical doctors from the public health unit to check on how they were going and to ensure that they were receiving appropriate care. 
Um, and that care includes things like making sure that people have strong painkillers if they um, have painful lesions, particularly, as I said, um, if they have pain, uh, painful lesions around or in their butt, just because that's such a problematic area to get painful lesions because it makes it hard to pass stool. Um, and then there's lots of other ways to help with symptoms with monkeypox. Now, if you've got lesions, uh, and if you've got anal lesions, then uh, having stool softeners is really useful. So making sure that you um, that when you do pass um, bowel motions that they're nice and soft, um, so that it doesn't aggravate the pain from the monkeypox lesions. Um, we found that with genital lesions, so particularly lesions of the penis, that they are, were the ones that tended to get infected with bacteria. Um, so quite a few of those people needed uh, antibiotics to help deal with the bacterial infection that was um, affecting their penis in addition to the monkeypox infection. Um, keeping your fluids up, again, is really important to keep your bowels soft. Um, and then, as you mentioned, uh, if people get really severe infections or if people are at significant risk of severe infections, and by, by this we uh, particularly I think of uh, people with HIV who've got low CD4 counts. So again, a CD4 count of less than 200. Um, those people would be considered for uh, tecoviramat or TPOX. Um, and TPOX is a specific antiviral for monkeypox infections or orthopox infections. Um, so it's very different from, say, um, PrEP, which, of course, is also an antiviral, but it acts in a different ways, So it's effective against different viruses. Um, and I guess, you know, you could ask, you know, why don't we give TPOX to everyone, um, which is a reasonable question. Um, and there's a few reasons why not. Um, firstly, we, again, have very limited supply of TPOX in Australia, uh, and that makes it difficult. Um, and the other reason was that there was, there is some early data to suggest that if we use TPOX in a very widespread manner, either um, by treating everyone or using it as PrEP, for example, in the absence of uh, adequate supply of vaccine, then there is a risk that um, the monkeypox virus that we see might become resistant to TPOX. And then, of course, we would lose the ability to use TPOX for people who really need it because they have severe infection. So that's why we're not doing that. Right. No, no. I, look, I think it's just really good to let people know that if if you if you do get really really sick with this, and and um, uh, uh, it would seem that people who are unvaccinated, not people who are vaccinated, but people who are unvaccinated, um, even people who are well, have become very sick with this um, and and experience great pain. That there is treatment available and therapy available to to in, in a country like Australia to to help mitigate the pain that yeah people... yeah and, and it is very much recognized that these lesions are really painful as in recognized by the medical community so people shouldn't have any difficulty getting adequate pain relief um if they experience pain from the infection and of course seeking medical advice as quickly as possible please yes yes, yes. yep <laughs> Um, look, we we have no further questions, um, and I'm not going to to hold us here um, um, any longer than we need to. C can I? And Vincent, you were really comprehensive again, and I could ask you a whole lot of questions um, uh, about this. But of course, this is dependent upon the market and the people in this in the, in this um, forum. And so, if there are no further questions, I'm not going to hold it open for the sake of it. But can I ask both of you? Is there anything else that, that, that you'd wish to say, Matt or Vincent, um, before we look at closing off the forum? Matt? Uh, uh, you go first, Vincent, while I think of mine. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Look, I was just going, and I kind of hinted at it before, but I think it's just been really impressive how the community has come together um, over this infection. Of course, that's not unprecedented. Um, the gay community has significant experience in coming together over um, other infectious uh, diseases, um, you know, namely HIV particularly. Um, but it's really impressive how everyone has come together and how uh, the community has responded in a way that, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Like we're in a situation now where this infection is under control, uh, even though we have, we've had limited access to vaccine supply. Um, and I, I just think it's amazing. And um, so hats off to the community and um, as Matt was saying before, and I think I said as well, it's like now I think we just need to make sure that we um, give everyone an opportunity to get vaccinated as soon as possible so that we can be ready for the inevitable, which is that we will see more monkeypox come to Australia. We just need to make sure the community is ready. And, and Matt, 
I couldn't agree uh, anymore or couldn't agree stronger with what Vincent said, but seeing as he thanked the community, I think I do actually want to take a moment as well just to thank the healthcare professionals that are implementing a lot of these vaccines. So, you know, this comes across the back of, on the back of an incredibly busy time for a lot of the health service through COVID and now to look at the uh, monkeypox vaccine and particularly as well as you know the health response that we'll need particularly in New South Wales around world pride is going to be astronomical so I really do tip my hat off to the uh, nurses the admin people people that are supporting the vaccination rollout uh, to really uh, get a good coverage and get locations in as much of Australia as possible this has just been incredible so yeah, big thanks to all of the staff working on that. Oh, sorry, I sort of, thanks, Matt, that's very generous, but I, I thought of something else that um, I should say, given, I, mean, I think everyone's understanding of vaccines, I mean, everyone, you know, every, it's like everyone's had a science degree over the last three years, and uh, as in, I mean that, like everyone's one 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 so much health thing. information uh, that everyone just has a great deal of knowledge now. Um, what I did want to point out is that the these vaccines are very different from COVID vaccines. And I think the reason that's really important is that if you get these vaccines, you are very likely to have very long lasting immunity to monkeypox. It's not like with COVID where you're going to have to get a booster every six months um, or whatever it is now. Um, this is, you know, two doses, 28 days apart or two months apart or three months apart, however it works out. Um, and that should theoretically give you lifelong immunity against monkeypox. Um, part of the reason I say that is that monkeypox virus is a very different virus from COVID. Uh, it's a double-stranded DNA virus, and that means that it doesn't mutate as much. It can't mutate as much, but as a result of what it is. Um, and the virus uh, and the vaccine is a very different vaccine. Um, it's a whole virus vaccine rather than an mRNA vaccine. Um, so a very different scenario and I, I the reason I, I'm saying this is I think it's really important that people don't think oh okay I'll get my monkeypox vaccine now and then in six months time I'm gonna to have to get another monkeypox vaccine it, this is a this is a one-time deal you get it now and it's sorted yeah and it does it reduces the risk of getting the the, the virus as opposed to COVID which just reduces the 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 impact mm. or, or or the magnitude of symptoms yeah yeah um, thank you to the two of you. I just want to say for people out there who want more information um, on monkeypox or where to get a vaccine, um, you can go to your local AIDS council website so or, or go to a FAO's website and go to our members page and you'll find um, links to our member organisations, so such as ACOM, who, who Matt works for, or your Department of Health uh, in each jurisdiction or the Commonwealth Department of Health. And um, Emanate, Matt, will have information on where people can go to get vaccines. Is, is that correct? Yes. So I'm just putting the link in the chat now. Um, so if you go to the Finder service, which is in the uh, Access the Toolkit, or the link is in the chat, uh, we're uploading all of the sites now. So they'll start to come on. There's already some in there, and they'll just, as they get added to, uh, will be available. Great. That is fantastic. So thanks, Matt, for all your work with the communications and uh, and the, the the work you're doing to build communities awareness here in Sydney and, and across Australia um, with the health promotion program. And of course, to Vincent, this is the one millionth presentation that you've now done on monkeypox. Yeah, I'm almost well getting good at them, Heath. <laughs> well done. He, and this is not a recording. This is his live. Yeah. Um, so thank you again for all your presentations um, on the um, clinical profile. And I'm sure this won't be the last no. uh, forum that we do on this. So thank you to the two of you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, and have a good night.